Good morning, Saints of Hickory Grove. Pastor Eric sharing with you on Easter Resurrection Sunday 2020. Uh, today we are going to carry on through the Gospel of John, and we're looking back in John 15, verses 18 through 16, 4. And today we keep in mind that as Jesus is uh, talking with his disciples, really the about to be the last conversation that he has before being betrayed, that we need to keep in mind that the, they're on uh, the opposite shadow of the cross. The cross is in view but has yet to happen. And we as, uh, as covenant members of the body of Christ, that we live on the opposite side of the cross, that, we, that the, the cross casts a shadow uh, on us that is great and overwhelming and displays for us the immense uh, or the immensity of God's love and his forgiveness and mercy. And as such, I, I would like to share with you this prayer from the Valley of Vision. It's called the Resurrection. I think that you will find value of it. And, and if you can, go on Google or Yahoo or whatever search engine you use and look up these words. I, I encourage you, look up Resurrection value of vision, and I'm sure it'll pop up. The author writes this, O God of my exodus, great was the joy of Israel's sons when Egypt died upon the shore, far greater the joy when the Redeemer's foe lay crushed in the dust. Jesus strides forth as the victor, conqueror of death, hell, and all opposing might. He bursts the bands of death, tramples the powers of darkness down, and lives forever. He, my gracious, gracious surety, apprehended for payment of my debt, and comes forth with the prison house of the grave, free. And triumphant over sin, Satan, and death, show me herein the proof that it, his vicarious offering is accepted, that the claims of justice are satisfied, that the devil's scepter is shivered, that his wrongful throne is leveled. Give me the assurance that in Christ I died, in him I rose, in his life I live, in his victory I triumph, in his ascension I shall be glorified. Adorable Redeemer, thou who wast lifted up upon a cross art ascended to highest heaven. Thou who as man of sorrows was crowned with thorns art now as Lord of life wreathed with glory. Once no shame more deep than thine, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel, now no exaltation more high, no life more glorious, no advocate more effective. Thou art in the triumph car leading a captive thine enemies behind thee. What more would be done than thou hast done? Thy death is my life, thy resurrection my peace, thy ascension my hope, thy prayers my comfort. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I come to you now with the saints of Hickory Grove, your people. We are honored to be able to worship your Son here on Resurrection Sunday. We're honored to be the partakers of this creation, the one that you've given us to be stewards and managers of. Father, may your glory abound in our hearts and may we ever be in awe of your glory, in awe of your power and your mercy. Father, may we love you more than the things of this world. May we love the Creator more than the creation. May that love abound in our hearts. May your word, as we open it up today, may it teach us and correct us. May it bring us comfort. May it be like a balm to the soul, soothing us. But may it spur us on in our love for you and our love for one another. May it spur us on in the mission that you've called us to. May it spur us on in being good gospel citizens to point the world to your son, Jesus. Father, I pray for wisdom not only as a pastor and a leader, but as a as one that is saved by your son's blood. Give me wisdom to lead and wisdom 
to care for your people. Give wisdom to those in our government and around the world who are seeking to lead in the midst of this pandemic. Would you give them wisdom as how to proceed and to help protect the populace? But Father, we know that all protection comes from you, that all things come to pass according to your will. And that, Father, we seek more than anything that your will would be done here in Johnson County and across the world. And for those brothers and sisters who are gathering, would you give them strength and comfort knowing that there are many in our community, many across the world who think it foolish that the people of God would assemble, whether it be in a drive-in church service or in the house of of God. They think it foolish, but Father, there is nothing more foolish than not worshiping you and your Son on the day that we remember his resurrection. For the cross is folly to those who are, who are enemies of it, but to us it is glory, power, and strength. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Opening up to John 15, 18 through chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going to say some words that might have a negative connotation. And, and one of the, the, those words are incompetence and ignorance. Now listen, I don't mean them in the worst case uh, of the word. What I mean when I use the term incompetence and ignorance today, today is this. That we have all, um, whether it's in our line of work or whatever it might be, have been incompetent for a time. In fact, incompetent means that you're not competent. And as we grow, whether it's in a profession or in an area of study, whatever it might be, we expect to become increasingly competent. So we're moving from incompetence to competence. Now, there's reasons why we might be incompetent. Some of those reasons might be experience. Some that, you know, like you need on-the-job training. Something that you learn as you go. And for other reasons, you might be incompetent because it doesn't come naturally to you. If, if you're someone who is just not mechanical, you're probably going to remain incompetent your entire life. You're probably not going to be a mechanic. I am not mechanical. I am an incompetent mechanic. I don't look at that as a, a, as a negative for me because it's not something that God's gifted me with. But even the best mechanic was incompetent at one time, and largely that was most likely due to ignorance. They had yet learned. So ignorance is just the lack of knowledge. And people will stay in ignorance for their entire life thinking that their lack of knowledge is something to be treasured when it's not. See, none of us are want to remain in ignorance or incompetence when it comes to the cross. But what we see here in the text is that the reason that the people of God will be persecuted, that they will be treated like the Messiah was, is that the world is incompetent of the cross. And the reason that they're incompetent of the cross is that they've not been saved. And Paul exhorts us later on that the cross is folly to those who aren't saved. So that's going to guide our reaction to people. That's going to spur us on as, as we, uh, as we uh, um, experience those things, as we run into uh, those things. So keep that in mind as we go through this text, that incompetence and ignorance aren't inherently bad. They just are. But we can be grateful that Christ, through His Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit of God, has changed our hearts so that we're no longer like me when it comes to mechanic, mechanic stuff. That he has changed our hearts so that we can attain the knowledge of God. That we can learn of who Christ is. And that we can learn of faith and repentance. The promise given to us by Christ that is found in his saving grace and mercy that was accomplished there on that Friday on the cross. And the promise sealed and, and, and followed through with on that Sunday in which he came out of the grave. So we'll see here in the text that Christ's followers proclaim the gospel through the Holy Spirit despite the world's hate of them, or hate for them. So let's go to the text. Let's, let's read what John writes here. So again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, if the world hates you, now, there's an assumption here that the world is going to hate them. It's kind of like, well, it, it, um, 
when, when God says so that we might be saved, he intends for us to be saved. He's not saying, well, you might be saved, you might not be saved. When he refers to people as, well, so that you might be saved, he intends for that to be understood that you will be saved. So Jesus here intends for us to understand that the world will hate us. So if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now let's stop right here at verse 19. Understand this, that people hate or are in fear of the things that they don't know. And as we increasingly or progressively become more like Jesus, we will of course be less like the world. We'll have less of the distinguishing marks of the world. Or the distinguishing marks of the world. Well, if you look at Galatians and the the um, fruit of the spirit, before that we have the exact opposite of the fruit of the spirit, right? Sexual immorality, jealousy, all of these things. These things that are marked by character defects, by sin. We're marked by sin. We are identified with by our sin. We're no longer identified with by our sin. We're identified with Christ his saving grace and his mercy we're clothed with his righteousness so as people look at us and see us and we become increasingly more like christ we become increasingly strange to the world and as we become increasingly strange to the world they're not going to like that because we look like aliens to them remember the world that i said to you verse 20 remember the word that i said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you if they kept my word they will also keep yours. So there's the he, he's putting out the hypothetical there that for those who have kept my word, who have believed, well, they will believe yours because you're from me, you're of me. But here's the thing. Most people have not kept my word. Most people have not, uh, have not followed me. Therefore, they're not going to follow you. They're not going to keep your word. They're not going to listen to you if they're not of Christ, if they, don't, if, if they don't know him, if they have not been saved by him. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Why? They don't know God. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you. When their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And that is the word of the Lord. So we see here in verses 18 through 25. That's how we're looking at our text today. Uh, verses 18 through 25 and then verses 26 through 16 4 we see in the first set that the world hates christ followers because they hate god not the christ followers the world hates god the world hates god here's one way you can tell that the world hates god is that the world has made up so many different gods as one person becomes dissatisfied with their god they go and chase after a god of their own making the first commandment teaches us that there is only one true god and to worship only him the world hates God, so they make up their own gods to justify their actions. The world hates what it doesn't know. The world is incompetent in their ability to know Christ. Right? So, so, so the one, we're not talking about the one who eventually becomes a mechanic. We're talking about the one who is incapable of becoming a mechanic because they aren't mechanically inclined. People are not inclined to follow God. People are not inclined to follow Jesus. The world's ignorant in their knowledge of Christ. They don't know him. 
So if they don't know him, if they don't know Christ, if they don't know God, how God is, uh, their knowledge of God, they're, they're not going to have any desire to follow him. They're not going to be able to identify with Christ. They're not going to find their identity to, with him. They're not going to be clothed with his righteousness. They're going to be clothed with their sinfulness. Christ's very existence accuses and convicts the world of its sin. This is why Jesus said that I came into the world to do all of these things that no one else had done. His very existence, his proclamation, his presentation of himself to all the world around him when he was in Jerusalem and, 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 and abroad and in his ministry, that his existence, his actions, his signs all pointed to his divine nature and who he was and why he came. But his existence also accused the world of its sinfulness. And the world does not accept that it is sinful. Yes, it inherently knows, man, these things aren't right. Their conscience speaks to that. But man, they love that sin. They're unwilling to walk out of that sin. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit who changes hearts that they can recognize that and, and, and be strengthened to repent of that sin and turn to Christ. They are ignorant of Christ. They are ignorant of God. They're incompetent, in, unable to follow God. They're unable to follow Christ. The world doesn't know Christ's disciples as they progressively become more like Him. The world doesn't know you and I. As we become more like Jesus, we become more and more strange. And as we become more and more strange, we realize that we truly are sojourners here on earth, that our citizenship is in heaven, and that while here on earth we are like aliens, we are in a foreign place, a place that the world has dominion over at this time. And to know Christ followers is to know Christ as such, they point the world to him. So as people do get to know us as Christ followers, we are pointing them to Jesus. And as we point them to Jesus, they begin to lack ignorance. And as they lack ignorance and gain knowledge, they might be even more incompetent. Because what happens to the person that is trying to gain competency in a particular skill? And they read the books and... They get a tutor or they get a mentor, but even still, they just don't get it. They realize that this skill just isn't for them. It's not something that they will be able to develop. As people begin to lack ignorance of God, they begin to be pointed to him by his disciples. As the gospel is preached, it has an effect. And that effect is either the hardening of hearts, those realizing how incompetent they are and their inability to come to Christ on their own. And there are those who come on bended knee and confess Christ as their Lord and as their Savior, as the risen Son, as the risen King, as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We must realize also that we too, as Christ followers, were once incompetent and ignorant. That apart from the work of the Spirit, that we would just be like our, our fellow people of the world. That our hearts would be hardened and that we would hate God. But God saw fit to save us, giving us faith, giving us a desire to follow Him, giving us the gift of faith and repentance, being able to turn away from our sin. We see in the next set of verses, 26 through 16, 4, that Christ followers persevere in the midst of opposition. Persevere in the midst of opposition. The Holy Spirit testifies to the hearts of men and women who are called by God. He changes our hearts through the new birth, moving us from incompetent to competent. He bears witness to Jesus through the proclamation of the gospel, which moves us from ignorance to to knowledge, it's by work of the Holy Spirit, it's by proclamation of the gospel. That is how God has desired for his people to effectually be called. He, they are called by his Holy Spirit who changes their hearts and people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by their heart being changed and repenting of their sin and turning to him in faith. And they are clothed with the righteousness that was purchased on Calvary. The Holy Spirit humbles us as he reveals the grandeur of God's grace and our divine privilege. 
this reason we should look to the world with compassion and empathy. Unfortunately, all too often there are Christians, often the most famous ones, the ones that you find on Christian television, the ones that you find out about on the news, they lack anything but compassion and empathy. In fact, they often are quite wicked in their remarks, and it's disturbing. But we should look knowing that the Holy Spirit is the one who humbles us. The Holy Spirit is the one who changes our hearts and teaches us. It is the work of God that saves us, not the work of us. Why so that no one may boast, as Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says. Says Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. How then could any of us be full of conceit, conceit or take our salvation as something to be a source of pride? And I mean the ungodly pride that sees us look towards the world and say, You know what? World, we are far better than you are. That's damnable. Now why do I say that? Because the world is no better than we are. We're just in a better situation because Christ has redeemed us. Why? According to his own pleasure. Why? For his glory. Why? So that we might proclaim that glory and see others come to know Jesus. The world is not better than we are. We're just blessed. Blessed by God and not our own doing. How can we not look to the world with compassion and empathy, knowing that this is the best life that any of them will ever have? And our best life has yet to come. Our best life is eternal, found in Christ, in the restoration of all things, in the new heaven and the new earth. We persevere in the faith by the work of the Holy Spirit, while on mission to the world. The Holy Spirit is central to our lives as Christian as Christians, and is central to the proclamation of the gospel. Proclaiming God's word will have no effect without the work of the Spirit. So if, if we are preaching the word of God, now listen, God is glorified when we preach, share, and read the word, pray the word. When we do all this, those things, God is glorified because we are increasing our communion with him. We are proclaiming what he uh, has found to be true. What he is true, it's, it is eternally true and without error. He is glorified through that. But if we proclaim the gospel in a group of those who the Holy Spirit is not working in their hearts, they will not come to faith. It's a work of the Spirit. That's why it's not up to human eloquence and tactics and pragmatism to see people come to faith. It's up to the work of God. It's our responsibility is to proclaim the gospel where and when, when God has proclaimed or told us to. Which is, at all times, we should be proclaiming the gospel and every opportunity we have, praying and trusting that the Lord is at work. And maybe he's just at work when we proclaim the gospel, whether it's to someone else or to ourselves, that when we proclaim the gospel, he's using that in our hearts to convict us of our sin or bring us closer to him, to remind us of the good grace that he has given us through Christ. Because listen, we need the gospel day in and day out. We need to keep in mind Christ's life, death, and resurrection every single day, every moment. We need to know that God has redeemed us with the precious blood of his Son. We persevere in the faith by the work of the Holy Spirit. As we are persecuted by the world. The Spirit is our helper who equips us with strength, encouragement, and comfort. As persecution comes, Paul reminds us that persecution is a gift to the Christian. Why? Because adversity, I think it was Martin Luther who said this, that adversity is, is an aspect of God's grace because through adversity our faith is tested and we can find, uh, we can find our assurance in that. We can find the assurance that God has given us as we persevere through the face in the midst of adversity, in the, in the midst of persecution. 
Persecution is a gift and Jesus promises it to us. He promises us that, listen, you will be persecuted. He says that there are those who are going to throw you out of their synagogues. And why we actually see that happen. Why? Because in the Jewish faith, they, they viewed in the first century that this Christian sect, the, the people who were part of the way, as they called it at that time. So the way was looked at as a heretical Jewish sect. So what did they do? They threw these heretics out of their synagogues. As they threw them out of their synagogues, they were persecuting them. If we look in the first century, those who were being persecuted were the Christians. And who were they being persecuted by? Not the Romans. They were being per That came later. In the first couple centuries, they were persecuted by the Jews. The Jews throwing them out of the synagogue. The Jews seeking to, to uh, rip them out root and stem because they knew that this was going to be a distraction to their faith. That it was going to call people out of their faith, but we know this, that God calls Christians, called the Jewish Christians to go into the synagogues, proclaim the gospel. Why? So that some would be saved. And in the midst of this persecution, we know that God will sustain us, that he will see us through. He will strengthen us. That doesn't mean that times won't be difficult. They absolutely will. That doesn't mean that we won't have times of doubt or struggle. It will happen. What it means is that we will be comforted and strengthened by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Think about this. If we were thrown in jail, they can take away our Bibles. They can take away our hymnals. They can take away anything that we have, but they can't take away the faith that we have in Christ. And they can't take away the knowledge that we stored up through God's word right here in our heads and right here in our hearts. It's how Paul can sit in a Philippian jail singing songs of praise to God. If that time were ever to come here in America, maybe it's more realistic than we once thought with the current pandemic. We can trust in God that he has given us all that we need to carry out what he's called us to, which is his mission, to see him glorified in our world. We must rely on the Spirit to conform us to Christ, sustain us in the faith and carry us on in the mission of God. We must seek the Lord in all things. Everything that we do, day in and day out, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, we should seek the Lord in all things. Maybe it's as simple as praying to God and how thankful you are for your family. Or for the gifts that you have, the, the gifts of enjoyment, the sports that you enjoy, the television shows, the, the music, the things that you enjoy and consume, but also be thankful for the things that God has called you to, to produce. He's called us to be productive, to do things. So thank God that we have the ability to mow our lawns or uh, work on cars or go fishing. But also thank God for the work that he's called us to in our professions, in the marketplace. Seek God in all of it. Seek his glory and seek to glorify him, praise him, thank him. But also, look at whenever you're in interacting uh, with another person, whether it's in your neighborhood, at work, online, whatever it might be, look for ways in how you can point others to the glorious nature and work of God. Rely on the Spirit for that. Rely on the Spirit to inform you. When we walk by the Spirit, it means that we are seeking God in all things, that we are looking to the Spirit who indwells us to guide us and to lead us, and not some New Agey way. Listen, there is a concerning trend in Christianity today where we see the syncretism or the, or the, the marrying of New Age uh, um, things with, with the Christian faith. When those things intertwine, you have a new faith, one that does not save, one that calls people to apostasy, that draws them away. So when you say walking by the Spirit, we are seeing that uh, each and every moment we are looking to God to direct us, to guide us, to correct us, looking for His glory, looking to glorify Him, seeking His will, meditating on His Word, or maybe we're meditating on his attributes or his work. We must also rely on our 
we must also rely less on ourselves and more on Christ. You know, Christ has given us all things. He has given us His life. He has given us His righteousness. He has given us salvation. He has given us so many things. He's given us the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who comforts us, who strengthens us, who sees us through. But oftentimes we look to our life, whether it's making a decision about where to go to college or what job to take, or maybe it's even decisions within the church. We often use human wisdom and pragmatism to make decisions on how best to reach people with the gospel, rather than knowing that it's the gospel itself that reaches people, that it's the proclamation. It's the work of God when someone comes to faith. It's the work of God that we carry out and in the Great Commission. It's not our work, it's His. We must seek to be in the background, used simply as tools, Utilized by God. We must take ownership of Christ's call to be his witnesses. We must own it. We must own the work that God has called us to. It has been too long. Far too long within the Christian church that we have allowed the Great Commission to be something that we outsource to a church program or outsource to a board or outsource to another agency or, or um, things outside of the church. We think that we send money to a missions organization that that carries out the Great Commission. That's part of it. That's a good thing to do. But you and I need to take ownership of the Great Commission to carry out the work that God has called us to, to proclaim His glory and preach the gospel to all nations, every tribe in tongue, everywhere, starting here in Johnston County and moving beyond that. Because that is... What God's called us to. That's what he teaches us in his word. He teaches us that in the midst of that mission, in the midst of, uh, of becoming more like him, that we will receive persecution. And as such, we can see that we are becoming more like Christ. Jesus has called us to sign up to die. Jesus has called us to, to carry our cross, to chase after him. To, li to live up and grow into the righteousness that he's purchased for us. To chase after him. Not to chase after virtue or vice. But after our vicarious atonement. Our atoner. Christ is our great shepherd and our savior. He is our brother and our co-heir. There's not an aspect of our lives that we do not hand over to him. God bless you. God bless you as you stay at home in isolation and long for a time in which we can worship together again in person. We'll be trying to do these drive-in services that will be going on today for as long as we can um, until uh, either Jesus uh, returns, which hopefully is soon, um, until they outlaw the ability to do the driving services or until we are able to come back together as a church in, in our sanctuary. Um, may you rest today in the knowledge of Christ's resurrection. May you rest in knowing that he has saved you by his blood for his glory and his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father, we seek your your son, and we seek to be conformed to him, and we know that that is only possible through our knowledge of him and through the working of your Holy Spirit. And we ask, Father, would your spirit continue to strengthen us in this time of great uncertainty, uncertainty and challenge. May we seek after your glory more than the things of this world, and may we treasure Christ more than anything around us. As such, Father, May we find great comfort in you and in your word. May you use this time to bring families closer together, pointing one another to your son Jesus. May this be a time in which our desire to worship you together in spirit and truth is increased, and our longing for one another would be godly. Godly so that we can spur one another on in the faith as we work out our salvation Father, let us never tire of the gospel. Let us never tire 
of reminding one another about your son's life, death, and resurrection. May we always keep in view that although there was great pain on the cross, a great price was paid, that our life was purchased in his death. Thank you, Father, and thank you, Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you soon.